Hey and welcome, I'm Hammy and in my ongoing exploration of everything Overwatch 2 lore and story related, it's time to take a look at the recently released mythological skins. Many of Overwatch's skins have rich historic and cultural references behind them that give a lot of background and additional flavour to the lore and stories of our favourite heroes, villains and otherwise. Some are canon and directly show us things about the characters, most very much aren't. But either way, they have some awesome details. We'll be going from Korea to Japan, Bali to China and more over Amaterasu Kiriko, Hong Hai Air or Jenny to the West Junkrat, Red Boy, Demon Queen Moira and last but not least Shasa Reaper. Time codes in the description below if you want to skip to a story of your favourite character, let's get to it. Firstly, let's look into the culture and folklore behind Amaterasu Kiriko. Amaterasu is the Japanese goddess of the sun in some senses, a major deity of the Shinto or Japanese religion. Theoretically, she's an ancestress of the Imperial House of Japan, so Japanese emperors are descended from her. One of the three precious children of the creator god Izanagi, Amaterasu's siblings are the moon deity, Tsukuyomi, and the storm god, Suzanowo. You can see variations of this in her skin customizations, as a nod to her two siblings. There are several different versions of Amaterasu's birth. You can say that she was either born from her father washing his left eye specifically after visiting the underworld to try and save his dead wife, or as a result of her parents feeling a little bit frisky after creating the Japanese archipelago of islands. Amaterasu has myths and legends where she helped create both agricultural and silk farming. As well as being associated with obviously the sun and the bounties of the earth, Amaterasu is also sadly known for a lot of feuds with her two brothers. One variant of a legend says that Amaterasu ordered her brother Tsukuyomi to go down to the earth and visit the goddess Ukemochi. Ukemochi brought up foodstuffs from her mouth and presented them to Tsukuyomi at a banquet. He was disgusted and offended and slew her and went back to the heavenly lands. Amaterasu was offended by this. She had a rift with Tsukuyomi and therefore night and day were separated. Amaterasu sent a lesser god to Ukemochi's corpse and found a bunch of human foodstuffs and animals had emerged from it. As a result, she gave and collected these for humanity, starting agriculture. Rather more well known is Amaterasu's feud with Suzanowo. After their mother's death, Suzanowo was grief stricken and increasingly expressed his grief in somewhat violent and problematic ways, causing a rift between the brother and sister. He was also eventually expelled from the heavenly realm and proceeded to commit such offences against his sister after believing that he had won a competition the two had had that they'd get me honestly demonetized from YouTube if I told you about them. Go look them up. Suffice to say, to avoid any further harm coming to her people, Amaterasu decided to eventually shut herself in a cave and plunged heaven and earth into total darkness. The gods made a plan to lure her out, saying they were laughing and celebrating as another greater god had appeared. This got the attention of Amaterasu, who moved the boulder, opening the cave door so slightly to see a mirror. This was held up in front of her by the other gods outside and showed her her own reflection. Curious as to who this god in the mirror might be, Amaterasu slowly approached the mirror and coming out of the cave, the god sees their chance, shutting the cave door behind her and sealing it. Suzunowo was actually dismissed in disgrace to the earth and his adventure continued there. Fighting various creatures, he eventually got a very, very fancy sword that he gave to Amaterasu to try and heal their rift. Maybe that's a story for another day. You can see nods to Amaterasu in a lot of pop culture today. She's a playable goddess in Smite to MOBA. Some of this animation is from their skin spotlights and famously known as Amaterasu Okami in the Clover Studios Zelda-like action game where you are playing Amaterasu in the form of a white wolf saving the land from darkness. One of my favorite ever games, well worth a look. Okay, next up, the story of Hong Haie Junkrat. Now, Hong Haie is also known as Red Boy in English, and this is from none other than the epic 16th century Chinese story of Journey to the West. Now, you're probably familiar with this already. If you're interested in the Monkey King and other Journey to the West skins or the general story, do check out my old video I did when Overwatch's first Lunar New Year event released. It talks about the Tang Priests, Zenyatta, Friar Sand in Reinhardt, Pig as Roadhog and of course Sun Wukong or the Monkey King as Winston. Link is in the description below. Now if you're not familiar with Journey to the West, it's an account 
of the legendary Tang priest, a Buddhist monk, Xuan Sang, traveling to the Western prefectures to obtain the Buddhist sacred text. It's also about his trials, his suffering along the way, and the story of three famous protectors who all go with him as atonement for their various sins. These are, of course, Sun Wukong, the Monkey King, Fry Sand, and Pig. Now, the Junkrat skin Hong Haier here is Red Boy. He is the son of the Bull Demon King and Princess Iron Fan, who are kind of two of the adversaries in the entire journey to the West, villains of a sort. He's a pretty independent type living apart from his parents. Uh, the story of him, he gets his own volume. He tries to eat the Tang Priest as he heard that apparently his flesh would make him immortal. Disguising himself as a boy tied to a tree, Monkey actually sees through his disguise, wants to try and trap him, but gets tricked and, of course, Red Boy escapes with the Tang Priest. Now, Red Boy is dangerous because he makes a very, very special fire. Monkey actually goes to try and fight this fire. He goes to the Eastern Dragon King and asks for some of his rain, but this rain only makes the flames hotter. Now, as often happens in Journey to the West, when Monkey comes across some kind of obstacle that he can't get through himself, he often goes and asks various gods for help, and one such god is the Bodhisattva Guan Yin. Guan Yin comes and captures Red Boy, and he has to be her permanent disciple before the travelers continue on their way. Now, Journey to the West over the last few years has got an increasing Western audience through YouTube, TV, Opera, and many more places. And of course, in a video game, you may remember Enslaved Journey to the West as well. Now, next up, we have Shasa Reaper. So this is the Korean Reaper. So it was Jiosung Shasa. And there is in Korean folklore, the Shasa Bonpuri. It's kind of a Korean sort of hero epic, hero myth, talking about how a certain person called Gangnim came to be the death steward, as it were. So, as far as I understand it, there was once a kingdom or a province called Guayang, and the king of Guayang was harassed to understand the cause of death of one of his subjects, three children. The mother of these three children thought that they had died before their time, and little did she know, they were accidentally reborn princes from another nearby kingdom, which she and her husband had finished off when they'd come visiting and then accidentally out of their knowledge became the parents of when they were reincarnated once this lady had killed the three princes they were reformed as lotus blossoms which drifted down a river that this lady and her husband then ate talk about the circle of life typical mythology stuff anyway the king was fed up with this petitioning so he had to send someone and he decided that he needed to send one of his officials to go and visit death or the king of the underworld themselves, and summon him to the actual world to explain what happened here. So, the king sent for his officials. Now, one official, Gangnim, was so hungover and so drunk from a birthday, uh, a party for his 18th mother-in-law, outside of his official wife, by the way. So, turning up late due to this party, Gangnim was chosen by the king as being, unfortunately, the man for this job. Now, Gangnim asked his wives and concubines for help. Out of all 19, only two gave him some help, but both items that they gave him would be useful in his later journey. On his journey to the underworld, Gangnam traverses many of the usual kind of challenges. There was a crossroad with 77 paths, a lake of spirits that he had to get through. When he got to a certain point, he had to actually kill the Lord of the Underworlds, 30,000 soldier army, apparently with one blow, and actually succeeded in chaining up the Lord of the Underworld and getting ready to bring him back to the world of the living. Taking some mysterious directions from a spirit at one point, Gangnam eventually comes back to his home, but one of his concubines or partners doesn't recognize him. Now, as fortune would have it, they gave him a coat with a pin in it. They were one of the two partners who actually helped him before he went. And he realizes that actually three days or what he thought was three days in the underworld has been three years. But thankfully, his partner recognizes him by the item she gave him and lets him in. Gangnam probably didn't get on too well with his neighbors. As he shows up at his house, a neighbor notices him and actually goes and tells the king that Gangnam has just been hiding in his house all this time. Suddenly, the Lord of the Underworld, Yomra, shows up, as well as the king and Gangnim, and everything unravels. The identity of the dead children is finally revealed, with the couple getting their just desserts, but Yomra, probably due to the trouble that he caused in the Underworld, actually wants Gangnim. The king refuses, and the Lord of the Underworld plays a trick. 
He says that the king can either keep Gangnam's body or Gangnam's soul. The king chooses the body, and as a result, the body instantly collapses without a soul, and the Lord of the Underworld takes Gangnam, making him effectively the Grim Reaper. Last but not least, we move on to Demon Queen Moira. Now, this is a pretty cool one. I wasn't 100% sure on this, but after a little looking, thanks to those of you in the comments of previous videos who confirmed what I said in those, Moira's mask is a representation of Rangada, the Demon Queen of the Laax of Balinese mythology. So, Laax are apparently humans who practice black magic and have cannibalistic behavior. So, just the kind of people you'd invite over for dinner then. Now, in Balinese mythology, there is kind of this continuous story of Randa against Barong, or evil versus good. Now, Barong is a panther-like creature and character in Balinese mythology, and he's the king of the spirits and leader of the forces of good. There are a lot of dances and plays that are done showing the conflict between these two. Rangda is said in some stories to be an incarnation of Kalon Arang, a witch legendary that used to wreak havoc in Java during the late 9th and 10th century. It was said that Kalon Arang was a widow who mastered black magic, damaged farmers' crops, caused disease, and had a daughter who was very, very beautiful. Sadly, though, her daughter couldn't get a husband because people were afraid of Kalon Arang. Due to the anger of her daughter's plight, Kalon Orang has been associated with in various stories flooding and disease and bringing death to various villages that she went through. And last but not least, apparently if you go to one of the airports in Bali today, you can see a more modern interpretation of a statue of Orangda herself. Now, I'm not going to put it in the YouTube video because, well, it's a little bit spicy. Love the skin, love the mask, the theme, the effects coming out the back of it. Looks really, really cool and really loving all of the mythology that has tied all of these skins together. Thanks very much for tuning in to this skin lore and origins video where we've gone deep into the story, myths and folklore behind some of Overwatch 2 Season 3's mythological Eastern skins. If you like this video, throw a like, subscribe, of course that helps me a lot. Comment with what you enjoyed, anything that I may have missed, anything that you know yourselves about the culture and folklore behind these skins, love to hear about it in the comments. And for more Overwatch lore, heroes, voice lines, interactions, maps, everything to do with animated shorts, comics, novels, and more, do check out my channel here. Cheers for tuning in. Until next time, I've been Hammy. Take it easy.